um, a few words from the book of the Psalms. Um, for those who was in the Bible study Monday, I've been looking at David and, and Saul. And so it's kind of still in my spirit, a few of the thoughts there. But this thought came to, to me this morning on the, the joy of salvation, restore the joy of salvation. Psalm 51 from verse 10 to 13, I'll read from the King James. It says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. I'm just going to mute so we can hear clearly. He says, then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted. We know David um, committed sin, and, and we, we catch him here in his repentant psalm. Um, it's always a good place to go back to if ever we feel um, that we have maybe slipped away from our place of devotion, a place of consecration. You know, David just seems to articulate um, the kind of words that we need to be bringing before God and the, the attitude that we need to present before the Lord. And I've asked, you know, three questions this morning in prayer. It was, you know, what causes us it should be to lose the joy. Um, and apologies if there's any other typos. What are the consequences of lost joy? And the third question is how can we regain and retain the joy? And so I'm just going to mainly read from what I've made notes on this morning as I prayed on the subject. So if I'm looking down, that's I'm just checking on what I read, what I wrote. Um, as we see here, the psalmist is saying, creating me a clean heart. I'm just going to try and use his words to answer these questions. So one of the things that causes us to lose joy is this, this defiled heart. And he says, you know, create in me a clean heart. And sometimes we, we think of defilement and uncleanness um, as being the worst of sins. So you know, sometimes our minds may go to the extreme of what David did because his heart wasn't clean. He ended up committing adultery and so forth. But what I was seeing this morning that, you know, the defiled heart is not merely a bad heart. It can be a divided one. Um, I, I think of James when he says in, in his writings, cleanse your hearts, you, you double minded. And so sometimes having a divided vision um, not really a firm sense of, of what we're doing for God. You know, sometimes our, our mission is interrupted by, by uh, flesh missions, you know, things that we would love to do, but not necessarily things that God has called us to do. I've written here, it can be the result of a divided heart, one where passion and focus have been lost by the introduction of other desires or the elevation of, you know, material concerns. Um, I preached a few weeks ago in the church about the cares of life and how sometimes we are, we are carrying so much and that it is not that believers and some believers don't love God, but many of us carry so much and too much that we, we, we don't have time for God in the way that we should have. And so the defilement in that case, you know, is not, is not sin in a sense of wanting to do evil but it's a fact of accumulating so many things to do that we have become um, defiled. We have, we have not stayed in a place where we're able to even cleanse as much as we should, right? So, you know, you can think about, now I've been in situations where because of work, you've had to work around the clock. You know, I've done like a 36 hour shift. And so in that space of time, you know, 36 hours, I have not bathed. Now, I've been earning my money, doing the right thing, you know, making sure the company doesn't lose and fall over. Um, but at the same time, I've become unclean just by virtue of what I haven't done. You know, so uncleanness cannot just be a, a ba on the basis of what you do, but on the basis of what you don't do. When you are not regularly and frequently in the presence of God and in the place to pray and in the place to read his word, then you're not, you're not applying the cleansing agents to your life that you need. Um, the Lord said that you, you're clean through the word. 
And so without being in it, I just, I just don't have the soap that I need. And even just washing in water is, is one thing, but to use soap is another thing, right? So the word of God fragrance our life. It adds, it adds a savor and a scent. And so these things, we can discern them in the spirit. We can discern uncleanness because when somebody doesn't smell good, you just know it. And so, so, so we can lose our joy because we have become defiled in more than one way. It might be an evil desire, uh, but it, it might be that we have just become so filled with other things that we, we're just not on the agenda of God as we should be. I've written here, it can be one where motive has shifted. So we talked about Saul on Monday and uh, he came to the throne with a good heart. He was a very humble person when he started out. He was God's choice. But over time and the longer he was in power is the more prone he became to making bad decisions. You know, Saul was in a position to consider things at a level he did, never had to consider before. He was just another guy in town. Yes, he was head and shoulders above everybody else, but he, he, he didn't use his physical attributes um, as a means to, to, to put himself above others. And that's kind of what attracted the Lord to him. And though he started out well, as he had many different decisions to make, he, he just ended up failing. Um, his heart became filled with with pride his motives switched and he went from you know evacillated between loving david and hating david you know he, he became unstable the bible says a double-minded man that comes back to this this divided heart a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways and when you look at saul he was hugely unstable because his heart now was divided um he had he had concerns for power, concerns to retain power. Um, you know, he had all these different issues and it came down to his lack of obedience. And so when our motives shift, it can also be a reason for us to lose our joy. And we'll come, we'll come down to why this, is, why this happens because we cannot really retain joy if we don't have a singular focus. The psalmist says, one thing have I desired and that will I seek after. Yeah, the enemy doesn't always have to make you hate God um, to bring you down. He can just give you too many things to focus on. And that's how he brings you down. So you're not giving God everything that he should have. Um, the best way to challenge what you think is to change what you know. Okay, now let me, I've jumped, I've jumped my point let me jump one back up sorry so two we lose joy when we don't have a right spirit so to the second point and it's similar to the first point when he says renew a right spirit within me um, but we can lose joy when we don't have the right spirit and when our spirit is not right before god so it, that can sound like you have the wrong spirit in terms of another spirit but sometimes it's just a case that there's something wrong with your spirit your own spirit has changed your attitude has changed, you know? So when we talk about your spirit, that is the energy that you bring to the table. It's the desire that you bring, it's you. It's your inner person. When it says to worship God in spirit and in truth, we've covered this before. It's about your spirit, about worshiping God with your emotion, with everything that is within you. So sometimes our spirit is wrong. We have shifted our energy, we've shifted our focus and we can go through cycles um, of transformation um, by virtue of mind renewal. So when Paul says, be thou renewed uh, by, in the spirit of your mind or be transformed by the renewal of your mind, this is about the journey that your spirit goes on. Every now and then, your spirit needs to be challenged. Every now and then, your spirit needs to be renewed. Every now and then, your perspective on things needs to be challenged. Um, so, you know, the way we look at church, when we talk about the first love, going back to your first love, the, the, the need to go back to your first love is a matter of where your spirit was versus where your spirit is today. Okay, so your spirit needs to be reminded sometimes. Remember the first love. Remember how you used to be about church. Remember how you used to feel about prayer. Okay, your spirit has shrunk from a place of zeal and gone to a place of it's not that important. So the spirit needs to be 
challenge and in the scriptures scriptural context that is what we call the renewal of your mind so this is back to the point i was making too early the best way to challenge what you think is to change what you know just stay with me here the best way to challenge what you think is to change what you know and that is to provide um, a new experience to your spirit a fresh perspective to your spirit you know, you might think that certain food don't taste good, but the only way your view is changed on that is when you taste it cooked in a way that is good. You know, I'm one of those folks. I don't really like turkey. I'm not a turkey lover. And what I found out is, is that most of the people that cook turkey for me didn't cook turkey very nice. Okay, then you meet someone who makes turkey and you think, oh, I could eat turkey now. What's happened? My experience has changed. And that's changed my perspective. And that's how the Lord uh, renews us. It's by experience. And there's a few things that help us to come into a point where we are challenged again to see things differently. Prayer allows us to see things differently. If we really take prayer, I mean, these sessions are touch points. But when we talk about praying, I'm talking about going back into your own space, spending enough time before God for him to shift the way you see something in prayer. Sometimes you go into prayer to pray for somebody. Someone tells you about this person. Oh, I saw this person doing something bad. I caught them in the wrong place. Uh, they were doing something they shouldn't do. They were wearing something they shouldn't wear. And so you go down on your knees to pray. And maybe, you know, you're going in there to say, God, you see what this person is doing. And then in prayer, the Lord shows you a broken person. In prayer, the Lord shows you an abused person. In prayer, the Lord shows you someone that needs love, someone that needs care and attention. So you've gone from just being an accuser of the brethren now to being someone who, because of prayer, understand that this soul has a need. They may look like they're just a backslider and they're just rebellious, uh, but you don't see the doorway until you pray that this rebellious spirit came through a doorway of some kind of abuse. And so prayer is one way that the Lord changes our perspective and renews our spirit brings the right spirit within us. When you have a spirit to gossip about people but not to pray for them, you have the wrong spirit or you have the wrong attitude, right? Not that you have another spirit living in you, but your spirit is wrong. When you are happy just to talk about people who fail and ministers who fail, but you never pray for those ministers, you don't have the right spirit. When you just pick up on, you know, the, the weak points of other people or the weak points of other churches and say, well, they're not good because, and that church is not good because, you have a wrong spirit. The right spirit would pray for those people. The right spirit prays for enemies. The right spirit prays for those that despitefully uses. Okay, so there's a, there's a different perspective that we can have. And the Lord does that by changing. He changes us by giving us new perspectives. And those things are triggered by prayer one. And dreams and visions can also change our perspectives on situations and change our perspectives on people. Sometimes we're putting too much trust in people and the Lord might show you a vision or give you a dream to say that person isn't what they think they are. It isn't to make you hate them or to make you think ill of them. It's to warn you about the situation so we can be changed. Sometimes people have done us things and it has troubled us. We have become hindered from going forward because of other people. And it takes sometimes the Lord to change our perspective of that situation to get us out of a situation of murmuring, complaining, bitterness, and holding people up in our spirit. Sometimes we get deliverance from people not because they apologize, but because God has healed us from the hurt that they caused us because we can see that they, they hurt us from a place of their own damage. Another way that we can be um, changed is by the word, so the word can come. And, and change our perspective. The Bible says the entrance of his words bring light. They bring understanding to the simple. So the word of God doesn't always get you out of a situation, but changes your perspective on the situation. And all of a sudden, you don't feel so bad anymore. And then we can also be, be changed by interacting with the people or the things or situations um, at a different level. So you might hear about somebody but then when you talk to them, you realize they're not what people said they were. You know, you can take other people's perspective on a matter and you can form an opinion based on somebody else's information. But actually, the longer you sit with that person and talk to that person, you now begin to see them 
in a different light. And so when we don't have the right spirit, how does God change that? Well, he changes it by changing our perspective one way or the other. We have to be open to that. I'm going to try and come down the consequences of um, our joy being lost is that, you know, joy gives us energy. Joy gives us energy. And so the, the, the devil would love to defile your life so you can't operate in joy. And he would like to have, make you have the wrong spirit so you can't have real joy. Um, verse 11 there speaks about being cast away from the presence of the Lord. Well, away from the presence of the Lord, you really can't have the joy because that's where his presence is located. So the, the job of the enemy is to, to keep us away from being clean, keep us from having a right spirit, keep us away from the presence of God because joy is attractive. Joy is energizing. OK, uh, it's one of the, 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 the aspects of the kingdom where Paul says that uh, the kingdom is not in, in meat and drink but it's in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. We've taught on joy before. Joy comes from having a firm purpose and from pursuing it and seeing the fruit of it. Even the proverb says that the desire fulfilled is sweet to the soul, okay? So the Christian that lacks purpose will lack joy because they go around aimlessly and they don't know when they've achieved what they're supposed to have done. Right. When you when you don't have a purpose, that means you're not working towards anything. And one of the things, even in our natural life, if we're doing a project at work, one of the things that keeps motivating you, if you have a checklist of things to do, what's motivating is when you can start checking things off the list and you can see that you're getting closer to your goal. A lot of church is 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 pointless and purposeless and therefore it is joyless because we're not pushing towards a singular purpose. It is, it is not about souls necessarily being saved. It is not about necessarily people being filled with the Holy Spirit. When we don't see these things happen, we find other things to get joy out of. We get joy out of now the fundraising. We get joy out of feeding people. We get joy, you know, out of testimony service or being able to preach or being able to exhort. We are, we've lost purpose. And so we begin to look for joy in other things. Folks that struggle to find, um, to have joy, are those who have struggled to find purpose. Heaven rejoices over repenting sinners because the purpose of angels is to be a ministering spirit to men, supporting men on the journey from earth to heaven. So when the Bible says that heaven rejoices when one sinner repents, that's because the purpose of heaven is to be populated with men who repent. <laughs> so it brings heaven no greater joy than sinners turning to Christ. You see, you see the link here. So, so joy is really triggered by understanding what the goal is and what the purpose is. The Bible says of Christ that he, he endured the cross and he despised the shame, right? Why? For the joy that was set before him, because he saw the purpose. There was a goal. You know, going to work and having no purpose is the most soul-destroying thing. Going to start not knowing why you're doing what you're doing. It, it just, it is, it hollows you out as a person. And so to have our joy restored, we must really have purpose restored. When the purpose and the joy is restored, he says that now I can start to teach people. Now I can tell people. People can't begin to testify and tell sinners about Christ if there's no, there's no joy. You need joy to tell the story. Now I'll teach transgressors your ways. Sinners will be converted to you because I'm living a purpose-filled life. The Lord did not make hell to be populated with men. Nevertheless, hell enlarges itself to receive men. So, so heaven and does not rejoice. Even the Lord said he doesn't take any pleasure in the death of a sinner. Why? Because he didn't make man to die and go to hell. That wasn't his purpose for man. But heaven rejoices. When a sinner repents, it's seven o'clock. I need to, to close. But the final points on what will help us to regain and retain the joy. Well, the things that we've covered, the purified hearts. And we have to recognize what is in the place of the passion that we once had for the things of God. What has taken its place? We talked about David on Monday when David was not at war. His energy was not being put 
into warring a good war and fighting a good fight. And so he found alternative places to dispose of his energy and his time. And he got into a spiral of activity that would dishonor God and bring him shame. When we are not doing what God has called us to do, what has filled this space? What TV shows? What conversations? What friends? What family? What has taken the place of mission in your life? Until we can identify what that is, repent of it like David is doing in the psalm. He's asking, oh, Lord, you know, we knew the right spirit within me. He acknowledges his sins before God and he's able to say and put his hands on it. This is the thing that's standing in the place of my purpose. This is the thing. I surrender that to you, Lord, and I turn to you. The presence of the Lord finally, and I'll close with this psalm, psalm 1611, says that thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. So what we need to do then is continue to do the things that attract the presence of God. Sing the songs that attract the presence of God. Uh, take a posture that attracts the presence of God, that keeps the presence of God um, in our midst. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Why? Because in his presence is the fullness of joy. That's really where my joy is. When I find I'm trying to watch stuff or, you know, have to eat food or drink, you know, have all the favorite pleasures of the flesh to keep me happy, then, then really what I'm not doing, I'm not really invoking God's presence. I'm trying to feed my soul's joy by giving myself all the pleasures of this life possible. That's not how we get joy. That's not how we get peace. That's just temporal. We get real joy from being in the presence of the Lord. So take time to worship. Take time to seek the presence of God through songs. As I always say, go back through the hymn books. Don't let this time of prayer be your only time. Take your own time. Take more time. Take your hymn book and sing and sing through until you feel the presence of God. That's where the joy of the Lord is regained. And by fellowship like this, this is how we retain it. Iron sharpens iron. And even the countenance of one is able to brighten another. I pray this morning that your soul will be encouraged to retain the joy. As Nehemiah said that the joy of the Lord is your strength. If the enemy can take away your joy. He can take away your vigor. He can take away your strength. And so we want our joy today to be restored. God bless you. We're going to just go.